What is the smallest organism in the universe? Well, thinking about Ant-Man, which comes out this weekend, how small does life actually get? Well, first we have to define what life is because some of the for some of the smallest forms of life can't really be defined in the same way that we define our own lives, like viruses and bacteria, but if we had to pick a candidate, a good candidate would be a parasitic bacterium named Mycoplasma genitalium. Ooh, and just like the name implies, it lives inside the genital tracts of mammals, like you. <laughs> but it's, it's, what's really cool about it, aside from all the STI stuff, is, is that it is incredibly, incredibly small. In fact, it has its own name for its smallness. Ultra micro bacteria, which is basically a science way of saying ultra, 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 ultra tiny. Now, scientists haven't ca cataloged all the species of this bacterium, so there could be smaller ones, but right now we think that genitalium might be one of the smallest, and it is just 200 nanometers across. For, for a sense of scale, this is smaller than some molecules. If I scale down this drawing of the bacterium down to 200 nanometers, I would have to draw this 760,000 times smaller, which wouldn't even show up as a pixel on your screen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the show where I take all of your comments and questions and weird concerns about my life live, and I try to answer them off the top of my head. Last week, you had a lot of tough questions for me, and I got a couple of things wrong, so I'm looking to redeem myself in the eyes of you and whatever this place is. So I have occasional voice of the void, Nate here. Uh, Nate, what do we got? Let's, from, let's go. From Tesla Ranger. Ooh. If humans had big anime eyes, how would their vision be affected? <laughs> that is a great question. That is such a good question, Tesla Ranger, that I might just do that as a full episode. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm not going to try to answer that one. I actually have an episode about supervision, kind of, coming up pretty soon. I won't spoil what it's about. But anime eyes, how would, what would the world look like if you had anime eyes? Bam! Great episode, great idea. About a th I get about a third of my ideas um, from people commenting just like you, so that's a great one. I'm, writing, I'm definitely writing that one down. But to kind of answer your question without answering the full thing, um, I once calculated, based on the daily amount of sweat that a person puts out, if they had an anime-like situation where they were nervous or embarrassed and, in, and it one large drop came out of their head, <clears throat> Like that, that's the most common sound in, in all of anime. Um, if, if a single drop came out of their head and it was all the sweat in their body, it would be a sphere about this size. So, almost correct, but great question. I'm adding it to the list. Someone remember it, please. What's next? From Harlem Blue, my burning question of the week. Is the answer really 42? Uh, so, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, could the answer to all life really be quarenta y dos? Um, I don't know. Probably not. It depends on what question you're asking. The question is sometimes more important than the answer because of where it leads you. And I think what's cool about giving a, such a mundane-seeming answer to such an important question uh, I think what that does is just highlight the fact that the universe is um, not only weirder than we suspect, but it might even be too weird, such that we can't even get all of its secrets out of it. So 42 could just mean, what, what does it mean? We could spend our entire lives trying to figure out what that answer actually meant, which just leads to more questions. So what are the chances that this one number created by uh, the logical and numeric systems of a hairless primate on a single planet out of billions and billions and billions is the secret to everything in the universe? Probably pretty low, if I had to guess. What's next? From Matterbeam. Hey, MB. My question for today is, how much research went into the mind-blowing Ant-Man episode? 
Yeah. Uh, so the Ant-Man episode that came out yesterday, we're trending. Go watch it. Um, I, I, I didn't want to do uh, the, the simple approach to, to Ant-Man, which is, oh, how dense would he be? Or would he create a black hole? We'll get to that in footnotes. But hint. Uh, I, so I wanted to take a more, a, a weirder approach to the Ant-Man problem and knowing what's happening in the MCU and knowing that the next couple of films are going to have to answer the Infinity War questions uh, and knowing uh, the science advisor to Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, he's a, he's a personal friend of mine, uh, I asked him where he thought the ideas and uh, the MCU were going. He doesn't actually know, so I don't have any insider information because they took out pages of the script before he read it, just in case. Um, but I wanted to see, knowing that quantum mechanics and the quantum realm in Ant-Man will be important, I wanted to see how might it be important from a scientific uh, point of view. So to answer your question, research being a I, I took physics classes, like one, two, three, and four, but I'm not a physics major, I don't have a physics PhD, so trying to wrap my head around world lines and Feynman's mirror and, uh, and light cones and all that, um, like a lot of episodes that I do, it takes about a full week of my time just thinking about it. Like, literally just floating in here for nine hours thinking about one thing and trying to write it in a way that I understand and then that is coherent for all of you. So, a lot. I hope it was mind-blowing because I still don't understand it. But if you think you understand quantum if it, <laughs> but if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. What's next? Ex from Exploding Peach. Ooh. Is, is there a minimum size the wasp needs to have to fly? Ooh, good question. So I'm interpreting your question to mean if you had, oh, how many body segments? Oh no, uh, I think it has three. Probably wrong. Two? It's live, gotta go with, gotta roll with it. Uh, so I interpret your question to mean, wasps have, have, have four wings, but they're separated. Um, is there, could it get small enough such that the wings wouldn't function in the same way anymore? Or would it get large enough such that the wings wouldn't function anymore? I don't know. Um, I know there used to be dragonflies that were, <laughs> were a couple feet long uh, back when there was more oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, so uh, the wasp could definitely get smaller than a human person. Uh, but how small could it get before the wings didn't function in the same way anymore? I don't know. That, that's a complicated aerodynamic question. Although I will redirect to say that when you're really small, sometimes it's not the thing that you expect that makes you fly. So I just read a study that came out today or, or this week about ballooning spiders. Oh, how many body segments do they have? Uh, two? Two. Uh, ballooning spiders, which are spiders that use their webs. Dang it, I have this backwards, don't I? They, <laughs> they, use, they use their webs and they kind of stand tippy toe up on a tree branch or something like that and they emit silk out of their spinnerets called a dope. It's a slurry of dope because it also is. Uh, and it forms this cool protein strand. It comes out and has all these awesome mechanical properties. It's spider silk. But it comes out like this, and then they ride. They ride through the atmosphere. And they, they've been found, uh, I think, over 1,000 miles out to sea. They've been found two miles above the surface of the Earth. They're just flying around. And for the longest time, ever since Darwin, actually, when he was writing The Origin of Species, we didn't know how this happened. It's, common, it's a common assumption that it's just the wind. Oh, they emit silk, and then the wind picks them up. And the wind provides the thrust, but scientists still didn't know. So just this week, there was a study done looking at how spiders might, uh, ballooning spiders might actually fly. And they put them in a box with no wind, but they put an electrical field inside of that box and they found that the spiders took off. The spiders took off under electrostatic repulsion Using the electrical fields that are in the atmosphere, these spiders create 
uh, electrical differences on their bodies which force them up into the atmosphere and they fly. In fact, the scientists found that uh, wind and wind gusts are not necessary to explain their flight at all. So this is, this is an awesome, uh, this happens all the time, this is, this is awesome. Something that we thought was easy to understand, oh, it's just the wind, is actually so much more complicated and so much more interesting than we could ever imagine. S ballooning spiders that fly, fly on fields of electricity through the atmosphere. How metal is that? Spiders are even cooler now. And they got tiny little cute eyes. Sometimes a bunch of them. What's next? From Shomari Wallace, what is your favorite magic system? Like, of magic? Or of Magic the Gathering? I play EDH. Um, what's my favorite magic system? Hmm. I don't, I don't even know, I don't really even know what you mean. So I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question. But I like to water bend. What's next? From Tanner Cook. Nailed it. Kyle, will you, will you be my science advisor on a sci-fi novel I'm writing? Uh, so I don't know if you sent me an email specifically. But I get a lot of emails now about science advising on people's work and uh, the simple truth is that I would love to, but I simply don't have the time. And uh, uh, it, it would be very cool, and I appreciate so much that you consider me uh, an expert enough, I'm not, to help you with your work. Um, but I, I simply don't have the time. I'm literally, um, every minute of every day that I'm working, I'm working on this show and doing this kind of stuff for you. So uh, I'm sorry that I can't directly help you, but maybe in making these episodes and stuff like and stuff like that i can help um, inspire topics in you that you could look into further that would help your own work maybe uh, suggest uh, future episodes that are kind of what you're uh, looking into and if i get to those maybe it will help um that's just uh that's just that's just the way it is uh otherwise i wouldn't be able to do this every week so uh thank you so much but i can't but i'll try tangentially because life, uh, time's a flat circle and I'm a tangent on it. What's next? From Lucky038, question, if every human on Earth jumped at once, what mm. would happen? Vsauce has a video on this. <laughs> Vsauce has a video on what, what would happen if everyone jumped at once? Well, jumped comes from the Latin word, which means tangent, which I'm going on right now. And what's weird about a tangent is that it's part of a circle. <laughs> That's my Vsauce impression. I'm, no, I mean, no disrespect to the man. He's incredibly smart, but he's got a very, uh, very recognizable style, which, I'm, which I like. Anyway, um, what, hap what would happen if everyone jumped at once? Uh, Vsauce style. So, uh, the gist of, you should go watch Michael Stevens' video on the subject if you haven't. Millions and millions of people have. But the gist of it is this. This is still accurate because when you're standing on the earth, everywhere is down. Weird, right? So, the earth is so big, it is, <laughs> from, doing this sh from doing this live show, I know this off top of my head now. Uh, 10 to the 24th, 23rd, 24th, shouldn't, shouldn't have jinxed it. Uh, the earth is so massive, 6 trillion trillion kilograms, that uh, it significantly outweighs the mass of all humans on earth. And so if we do a simple momentum calculation saying, oh, the mass, well, how, how, what velocity would you give this mass if the mass of all the people just jumped up and came down with some velocity. And when you do that math, as you can see in Vsauce's video, the amount that the Earth would move in response is negligible, like widths of protons negligible. So if everyone jumped at work, if everyone in the world jumped at once, what would happen? Probably nothing. Do you know what would really happen, which is uh, outlined in XKCD, uh, I think in his book, What If? 
Randall Monroe is my spirit animal. He's amazing. But if everyone was located in the same place on Earth at once, they jump and they say, oh, that was cool. We should probably get out of here. And then there would be so much congestion and chaos in that one spot of Earth with, every, with, with all of humanity in it that it would, it would create a humanitarian crisis and economic collapse uh, and famine uh, on the scale that has never been seen before and a lot of humanity would die. Consequences. What's next? From Mr. Diglett. This is right, right? Put in the chat if it's right. I'm pretty sure it's right. Yeah, Mr. Diglett. Hey, Kyle. Love the show. Thank you. My four-year-old daughter has a question specifically for you. Oh, great. Can a moon have a moon? Can a moon have a moon? Uh, that's, that's a hard question. Thank you so much, little one. Um, can a moon have a moon? I don't know of any, I don't know of any moons in our solar system that have moons themselves. I would guess that because moons are very big and what they orbit are very big, like the moon, not to scale, around our Earth, that if there was another smaller thing orbiting that moon, it would probably either get pulled down to the moon that it was at, or it would be pulled down to the Earth. It would be a, an unstable system, so to speak. So it wouldn't be perfectly going around in a mostly circular orbit around whatever it is orbiting. So um, I'm sure an astronomer correct me, could correct me, but uh, I don't know of any moons that have moons. Um, although I like where your head's at. That would be very cool. What's next? From War Hero 567. Does a void make your hair so amazing? Did you request it, or do you do it yourself? Um, the void, again, I'm, this is an evolving concept for me. I'm not, I'm just beginning to understand what this is. Um, but uh, I, I believe the hair is mostly because genetics, which is a show that I'm not qualified to do. Also, real talk, argan oil helps a lot. What's next? From Alex Kun. What are the consequences of becoming a cat-human hybrid through gene splicing? Hey, you're not a supervillain, right? Hey, just, just wondering uh, if I combined a cat and a person, would it be cool? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, we, have, we have genetically engineered cats. There are, I'm not gonna try to draw a cat because it's not gonna go too well. Um, but we have genetically engineered kittens to glow in the dark with, I think, jellyfish DNA. So there has been gene splicing on kittens and have made the cute little kittens glow in the dark. And if you Google it, you'll see them and they're adorable and I want to love them until they feel satisfied with the amount of love that they have. So if you were to splice human DNA with cat DNA, it's a very complicated question, supervillain person. Uh, it, it would depend on how much, uh, how many genes you are splicing in, are you splicing human into cat or cat into human, majority gene speaking or, yeah, super complicated. It would, it would very much depend. Um, could you take certain genes out of a cat and insert them into a human genome with like CRISPR case nine or something like that and get some beneficial uh, attributes from it? Maybe, possibly, but uh, uh, re the real fruits of genetic splicing, at least on animals, we do this with plants. That's how our crops grow so well and uh, there's enough food to feed everyone. A lot of it is because of genetic engineering and, for the, and as far as we can tell, it's safe, so we keep doing it. Um, but we don't really do it on animals as much, or animals such as we, because there's ethical concerns. So it's gonna be decades before we can, we can say, it's like, well, you don't, you, don't wanna, you don't want one of those cat people because the paws get dirty too fast. Like, we're not gonna know that anytime soon. Ask, uh, or just go to uh, play Skyrim. You know what I mean, nerds. What's next? Uh, from Wyatt Rose, how cool fast name. would you have to run to run on water? Hmm. How fast would you have to run to run on water? I don't know. That's a that's a that's a, that's a very specific calculation. Uh, 
which has to deal with the surface area of your foot and the speed of your and the speed of your legs and can human legs move that quickly? Um, I remember there's that viral video years back where those guys wore those hydrophobic, well they were hydrophobic, but hydrophobic shoes and they could run on the edge of a lake, which is completely false. Um, based on the surface area of our feet, I'm just going to wager a guess that it is much faster than any human can run. Um, but if you increase the size of the feet or you decrease the mass and the size of the thing running, then it is very possible. Uh, water strider bugs, don't know how many body segments they have. Water, <laughs> water strider bugs um, can just put their legs on the surface of water and the, ten the, the water tension, surface tension, there we go, is enough to hold their bodies up above water. The uh, Jesus Christ lizard is small enough and its legs and, it, and its feet wide enough and webbed enough that it can run on the surface of water um, and we can probably run faster than that lizard. So, uh, depends on what variables you want to change. Either you get super legs or you get super tiny. Could Ant-Man run on water? Don't know. What's next? From Bantha Fodder. Oh. As per the Ant-Man episode, how big is too big? Or at least, what would happen if Scott grew to the size of a planet? What? What? What would happen if Scott grew to the size of a planet? Well, um, my intuition would be that before you got to the size of a planet, very, very bad things would start to happen to you. Your body has evolved to um, operate under gravity and with the so average size of human that you are. So if you got really big or really small, uh, things like respiration, how you breathe, things like your blood pressure, um, a lot of these things would get out of whack really quick because uh, your surface area and your volume do not increase in the same way. So you would, uh, one's cubed and one's squared. So you would start to have a lot of problems very quickly. At some height, if you're also scaling up mass, the surface area, the cross sectional, not surface area, the cross sectional area of your bones would not be able to support your mass. But Ant Man, if he's keeping the same mass, when he gets about 60 feet tall, or let's say, 60, 70, 80 feet tall around there, he's gonna be around the density of air, and he's gonna be light enough to become a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade, nailed it, uh, float, and he's gonna float away. But I would guess there's still, there would still be crazy circulational pro uh, circulation problems and uh, nerve problems and, and all this stuff, so he'd probably die if I had to guess. What's next? From Riddle Sifts, sorry, zero five. What is the void made of? Um, what is the void made of? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a trick question. I don't know if it's made of anything, in as much as nothing is. Look, I, I've been I've been working on this for a while, and I, a lot of you people are uh, a lot of uh, everyone commenting is is asking about the void and how it works. And uh, this is something I've only recently started looking into, and uh, I should have more on it soon, hopefully. When I'm not doing this, I'm trying to figure this out, um, making some progress. I'll keep you apprised. Appraised? I'll work on my pronunciation first, which a lot of you have a lot of trouble with. Apparently, temperature, temporal, these are normal to me. Leave me alone. What's next? From MJ00, where does the fire in a dragon's breath come from? Mm, fire in dragon breath. I like two different explanations. Oh, and I forget, I, I messed up this term before, but my first uh, explanation that I like a lot is uh, hypergolic hypergolic chemicals. It's either that or another word I usually confuse it with. So hypergolic chemicals, when they mix they separate, they are fine. So if you had two streams of chemicals, say in like tubes, it's fine. But once they, once you cross the streams, so to speak, these two chemicals explosively react 
with each other and produce fire and steam and smoke and all that nonsense. And uh, we use this in some of our rockets and the bombardier beetle uses it in its biology. It has two different chambers and then it mixes them right at, at its butt and then it sprays out caustic hot liquid in predators' faces. Uh, so if a dragon's mouth had two tubes, let's say just on the inside of its cheeks, that sprayed out like a, a pressurized, pressurized liquid that would come out as a gas, um, like butane lighters or something like that. Ah, we're on the right track. Uh, then they would mix in the air and they would come out as a giant fireball, maybe. I like that a lot. Another explanation that I like a lot would be that you have a, as, as the dragon eats, it, it starts to accumulate all the gases from decomposition from the stuff that it's eating. And maybe majority of that gas is methane, which it stores in this let's say, a fire sack, and uh, it's compressed. And at will, it can release it, again, maybe from a pressurized tube in its mouth or something like that. And then when it gets out, it could use, let's say, a tooth. Let's say its, tooth, its teeth are very mineral-based. And when the gas is coming out, the, the dragon clicks these teeth together, and it forms a little spark. And that spark ignites the methane, and you have some kind of combustion reaction. Those are my two favorite explanations of how dragon fire works. Dragon fire. But, you know, what do I know? What's next? Last question. Okay, last question. Oh, uh, came, what you, came early. What are you doing for Comic-Con? Comic-Con. So, uh, Comic-Con is like Nerd Super Bowl for me and for Nerdist. Uh, so this year at Comic-Con, Nerdist will be taking over Sparks Gallery in the gas lamp in San Diego where we'll, we will be doing a bunch of stuff. We'll be doing a programming, uh, the, the, entire, the entirety of Comic-Con. There'll be live shows. I'll be doing this live show live from Comic-Con if I can escape for just a short amount of time. And uh, Natural Selection will be live from Comic-Con and we'll have... Uh, meet and greets, and we'll be selling merch, new merch, for this show as well. So if you are down in San Diego over Comic-Con, uh, you can go to Nerdist.com and look up our uh, Comic-Con panel announcement and all the stuff that we're doing, and come by and say hi. I would love to meet you, honestly. So thank you so much for watching another episode of Because Science Live. It's been a week. It's been a week. Um, next week, new vlog. New episode, new live stream. I hope you'll join me because we do a lot of nerdy stuff on this channel. So hit that notification bell, fam, or like it wherever you are. And um, have a great weekend. And be nice to each other because, you know, this is all we got. <laughs>